So we just wait for another minute to allow people to, to come in and the virtual room. Numbers are already going up. Very good. Yeah. So let's wait another 30 seconds. Okay, I think we can start. Numbers of participants are stagnating coming in. Uh, so good evening or good morning, where, wherever in the world you are, and welcome to this ENS Spine Section webinar uh, of the, the month of October now. Um, I'm very happy to, to have as guest today Dominic Rotenflu. Um, Dominic Rotenflu is uh, from Switzerland. He's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, was trained in Switzerland before he spent uh, many, many years in Oxford, UK. Uh, 10 years uh, and has a lot of expertise in, in very complex spine surgery, whether it's tumors or deformities. Uh, it's a very experienced spine surgeon doing spine surgery only. He's the newly appointed uh, full professor and chairman of the Department of Spine Surgery at the University of Lausanne. So he just returned to Switzerland to, to his home country. Um, he's a close friend of the ENS. Uh, he's active in many courses, uh, since many years active in the ENS advanced spine courses and in the training courses as well. So there, there's a quite close relationship between Dominic uh, and the ENS. And this is even more important now as you're the uh, education chairman of, of uh, Eurospine. So I'm happy to, to have you here tonight. And uh, with a special topic, uh, rare uh, pathologies, but important to, to know these pathologies, to know the, the algorithm in, in, in the workup of these pathologies is primary spinal tumors. And uh, Dominic's gonna share his expertise in the treatment of those primary spinal tumors and the surgical treatment of these tumors. Dominic, welcome and we're happy to hear your presentation. Thank you very much, Florian, and especially thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction and, and the invitation. As you were saying, um, uh, I think ENS, myself and Eurospine are good friends becoming more and more and collaborating more and more. And certainly when you ask me whether I'm available for this webinar, I didn't hesitate to, to confirm. So as you were saying, I was um, working for 10 years in the UK um, and most of it in, in Oxford and uh, and just recently moved back to Switzerland uh, a few months ago and um, now heading the spine center at the University Hospital in Lausanne. But most of that work that I'm going to present or pretty much all of it has actually been done in Oxford. So that's why I'm changing the slide color still. And um, and I would especially like to acknowledge the team in Oxford and uh, my esteemed colleague, Jeremy Reynolds, with whom I've been uh, fortunate to work over all these years. And we essentially, when I joined Oxford, he had already started the tumor practice and I basically just walked in and joined him there. And then over all these years, we did it as a essentially team of two doing, doing these sometimes challenging and lengthy surgeries. So some of this talk is essentially about our experience, some of the cases that we've done together that will illustrate some of the points that I'd like to make, and then we'll, we'll have uh, time for discussion. So uh, primary tumors of the spine is really a rare pathology. You know, we deal with about one to two million cases, uh, one to two cases per million population. That means that in the UK, we had a reasonable caseload, especially, you know, serving a larger population and uh, for uh, uh, primary tumors. Whereas in Switzerland, that's now with a smaller population, those cases are going to be even more rare. And um, um, 
uh, that's relevant because they're challenging surgeries. They're resource intense and requires a team, in my view, a team in a large medical center to to treat most of these cases, especially the cases I'm going to show you uh, in, in a proper way. There is a debate, and we'll touch upon this, uh, whether anything appropriate resections are really possible, what that actually means, what does it mean to do to do anything appropriate resection or resection when we have clear margins. And it's very clear in most of these cases, we, we just have one chance to actually get it right and change the outcome of, of and, you know, the further course of the, of the patient. Those are the usual suspects in, in, in tumors that we deal with. Uh, they're benign and malignant tumors. Um, on the right, you see data from, um, uh, from the AO Spine Tumor Knowledge Forum. My, my colleague, Jeremy Reynolds, was a member of, is a member of that. And, uh, and, and those are the cases that are in the in registry kind of showcasing um, you know how frequent each each type of tumor is clearly chondrochondrosarcoma and um, ewing's osteosarcoma are the most uh, frequent malignant ones with a uh, schwannoma which we as orth orthopedic surgeons normally do not treat osteoblastoma hemangioma um, aneurysmal bone cyst the giant cell tumors being the the more frequent ones in in the benign section um so what are the indications for on block resection? Well, those are uh, generally malignant tumors that are low, high grade that have not metastasized and that are amenable to on block resection, which I'll, um, uh, I'll um, illustrate what that actually means. But it can also be aggressive benign tumors that are locally invasive um, that may uh, require or lend themselves to non on block resection. And you know, the word benign tumor is kind of a relative term. A benign tumor is probably only really benign if it is latent or not necessarily active. But when a benign tumor becomes locally invasive, can be aggressive, then it may not actually, then it does not metastasize, but locally may not be benign. It may require further surgery, revision surgeries, and have a tremendous impact and morbidity on, on the patient. So at some of these cases are then so benign after all. The goal for block resection of primary spinal tumors is is the one of the mo the most important one is really to gain low tumor con tumor control, and and thereby reduce the rate of local recurrence. Uh, we would like to prevent the tumor metastasis by resecting the tumor on block. So that that means with clear margins, and this should at the end of the day then also improve survival. And depending on the tumor biology, that is not always necessarily so, and it may need additional adjuvant treatment. Um, Separating the tumor capsule, and that's a, 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 an ongoing discussion, really, whether if a tumor has invaded the spinal canal, whether it's still resectable on block, but actually separating the tumor capsule from the dura and the canal is not associated with the same rate of local recurrence that we would get if we did an intralesional resection. That means if we breach the capsule and do not have clear margins anymore. So what are the re resection margins that we're looking at? Well, if this is the tumor, I hope you can see my mouse here. Um, so if, the, if this is tumor, whenever we breach the tumor, um, then we are intralesional. If we just correct it out, then it is an intralesional re resection with essentially no surgical margin. Um, if we go along the tumor capsule, which is what we in most cases do, then it is a marginal uh, uh, resection. And if we are in healthy tissue, then it is a wide surgical margin. Now, being within healthy tissue is actually rarely possible in, in the spine, essentially with the tumors that we've seen, if they come and are a bit more in an advanced stage, then they're not confined to a single compartment anymore. If they're not uh, confined to a single compartment anymore, we do not have a wide surgical margin, or you know what, in general surgery, they would call an R0 resection. Then we deal with a marginal surgical resection. And even though we can go wide in a larger area, as soon as we actually get to that tumor capsule, it is not a wide resection anymore. It is all, then it is already, we already deal with the marginal surgical, uh, margin, marginal resection. If we breach the tumor capsule at some point, then we're already intralesional, even though we took great care uh, to preserve, for example, the tumor capsule or get a wide margin any, anywhere else. That's, it, 
a bit peculiar to the spine and 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 um, that we cannot get these wide margins as one would normally expect so wide margins we can really only get if we're in intracompartmental this is a classification by tomita et al um, if it is for example just confined to the vertebral body then we can do the the typical resection that and i'm going to show the, the the classic technique by tomita where, where we transect the pedicles take the lamina and then do an, a spondylectomy um, there we're not going to breach the tumor and we're actually going to have wide margins margins most tumors that we've seen and the examples that I'm going to show you were actually in here in the middle. They were extra compartmental. So they've breached the, the bony compartment. They've breached into the spinal canal and sometimes compressed the cord. And um, and obviously the ones that are then have multiple sites of tumors there, they already have local metastases are not in continuity. Th those are not unblock resectable. We would not consider unblock resection in, in those type of cases. So the original work by Tomita has uh, shown and as some of his theories that uh, compared to palliative decompression, just debulking, which essentially is an intralesional resection or on block excision, um, the survival here um, was, was clearly better um, if we can compare on block excision for the primary tumor compared to um, uh, debulking or even just a palliative decompression, which is the line very at the bottom here. Um, uh, indicating that it really matters how we resect those those type of tumors. That's early data from from Boriani published about 20 years ago with chordoma and chondrosarcoma patients, and 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 show that um, um, that only a, a minor portion of patients have recurrences if they are re resected on block, as opposed to 100% local recurrence if we do an intralesional resection or if we breach the tumor. Then we now have a bit better data, you know, uh, we're in the, um, in the era of, of registries and, and study groups. And this is the, the data from the Aospine Tumor Knowledge Forum here on 166 cases of patients of uh, chordoma of, of the mobile spine, um, which, um, which shows that they clearly um, or they, they significantly reduced the rate of rec local recurrence if we consider anything appropriate versus anything inappropriate. Now, what does that mean? Anything appropriate here would mean that we have clear t tumor margins. If it is anything inappropriate, then we do not have clear tumor margins. So that means even a marginal resection that has an intact pseudocapsule across the tumor, the pathologist comes back and says well, there were clear tumor margins those would be considered to be anything appropriate. Whereas it does not have effect as much of an effect on the survival of the patient, funny enough. Um, even, you know, all these years after, after or, you know, in, in a shorter period of time after surgery, that is not like long term, like 20 years down the line. So statistical analysis did not show any significance there but it has a, has a clear effect on, on, on the local recurrence rate. And a similar picture we see here with sacral chordoma where the local recurrence rate, even after on block resection, is, is a bit higher. And uh, Florian and I, were, were, we have been working on a systematic review looking into this and also comparing it to the role of, of radiotherapy in, in these patients. And, you know, what I've highlighted here in red and is, is really, that's really the... Um, um, the, um, the difference between the anaking appropriate and inappropriate, so whether we have clear tumor margins or not clear tumor margins. So if we consider that in, in the future, um, a radiotherapy proton or carbon therapy may be the way to go with an intralesional debulking of the tumor, you know, then the radiotherapy has to be able to take care of that delta between anaking appropriate and inappropriate um, every section. So essentially the um, the red space in, in, in the chart. So there are many studies that have already shown the safety and and that there is a role um, and uh, for radiation therapy, particularly more modern uh, radiation therapy, such as proton or carbon therapy um, in order to get local tumor control. 
Um, the questions that remain, is it really as effective in local tumor control? If we then irradiate a younger patient with proton or, or a carbon therapy, then we get a lot of scarring around the tumor around that site. Uh, that certainly makes surgery a lot more difficult than it would have initially been. The question there is, you know, is, is surgery in terms of a block resection with clear margins then still possible after that radiation therapy? In some cases, it may not be if the tumor touches upon uh, upon vasculature, for example, which then would have to be resected together with it. Then it all of a sudden becomes a risk-benefit analysis whether on block resection is still possible. Current recommendations is really that um, with uh, in cordomas with where we have doubtful surgical margins or concern about the surgical margins, whether uh, or re recurrent sarco sarcomas, there, there's a strong recommendation to use um, adjuvant um, uh, radiotherapy. Um, whereas in, um, um, in, in primary resection, that recommendation is weak if we get clear tumor margins. Um, and the same is, um, um, uh, in, in the case when surgery is actually not feasible. Um, then, of course, we have no, no other option but to do uh, radiotherapy. A similar picture than what, what we saw for the chordomas, we see for the chondrosarcomas. Now, a chondrosarcoma is a bit uh, different type of tumor. It's a different beast in, in, in terms of um, that it's not necessarily amenable to many other uh, therapies. There's no um, uh, chemotherapy that uh, can... can um, can reliably control the tumor and it doesn't respond to uh, radiotherapy as well as, for example, <clears throat> a, a chordoma would. But the picture that we see here is, is quite similar to what we've seen with the chordoma. This is again is data from the AO Spine Tumor Knowledge Forum, also showing that uh, yes, it, it reduces the rec local recurrence significantly, but didn't have as much of an effect on, on the survival if we are enneking appropriate, so have clear tumor margins or do not have clear tumor margins. That would also then mean if we do on block resection or an intralesional resection. <clears throat> so the challenges that we're facing is really that the first chance is the most important and in, in many cases it's, it is, is the only chance to at least potentially cure the patients. Yes, there is a uh, recurrence uh, rate, and uh, but that initial operation um, is really the most Im important one. And we've seen this also in patients that we had to do um, uh, that we had to operate or were referred once they had a recurrence. Dealing with that recurrence is 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 much more difficult. And in the case of the chordoma, for example, it is actually quite a horrible course. Anecdotally, I once operated on a patient that had for a so-called metastasis of unknown origin. And whenever you have a metastasis of unknown origin in the spine, you, you know, you need to do a biopsy and really rule out the primary malignancy of, of, of the spine. In many cases, it could be a chordoma because the chordoma is a bit of a chameleon. It can present in many, many different ways. And so chordoma there was considered also by the pathologist. It was a, a test for brachyuri was done, which was negative, and it was concluded that it was an adenocarcinoma of unknown origin. I did an intralesional resection, reconstructed with, with a cage, and and um, and then two years later the patient came back with a recurrence, with at which point still we were still surprised that she was still around because the uh, according to the prognosis back then um the the prognosis wasn't that good and um and uh we did then another histology after the imaging and then the all of a sudden the brachyuri text was positive so we knew now that we were dealing with a chordoma and there wasn't an adenocarcinoma of unknown origin and as as it happens the metastasis then was along the axis i did a lateral axis to do a lateral res resection of the l3 vertebral body the tumor metastasis was along the uh, along the approach there um, around the nerve roots and and the patient was in terrible pain we did several revision surgeries on, on or two revision surgeries on her which could not touch her pain so in those cases is the recurrence is horrible, uh, leaving the patient in in a in a very um, uh, dire state with, with lots of pain that cannot be treated in any other in any other way and uh, reliably. 
So that brings me to treating a patient without a, an appropriate diagnosis and staging could really um, lead a, a potentially curable or controllable disease to, to incurable with, with, in some cases, really um, a devastating effects on, on long-term consequences for the patient. We certainly have to consider the anatomical variety and the location of the tumor, how it touches other structures, particularly the neural structures, and then discuss whether we can do a pur purposeful sacrifice of the nerve roots, meaning does the on block resection or the, the, does it does it justify the sacrifice of the nerve root in terms of the prognosis? Is the tumor really resectable in a reliable way? Because these are challenging and, re and uh, resections, but also reconstructions. And um, we always need to keep in mind, even if we do a fancy surgery, if at one spot we breach the tumor, then the prognosis may not be better than if we had done an intralesional resection um, um, from, from the start. So our approach has always been to um, get an appropriate diagnosis and treatment decision in conjunction with the sarcoma board. So all cases are presented and discussed in the sarcoma board in a interdis interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, uh, manner to then come um, to the conclusion what the best treatment for that specific patient is and and really elaborate the whole treatment uh, concept that may or may not include neo or adjuvant uh, therapy depending on, on the tumor type. It is a team approach that includes anesthetic in intensive care. Uh, it also includes blood management. Some of these tumors, especially the, the total sacrectomies can be very challenging, especially if they had, for example, adju neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, such as, for example, in an osteosarcoma. Then the surgery is long and uh, because of the scarring and, and one loses lots of blood, so we need proactive blood management from the anesthetic side uh, to com compensate for this only this way we can operate we can operate for 10 hours then our concept has been that we're two operate that we're two operating surgeons that allows us to to take a break if if it's a if it's a 10 hour course it also allows the other one to kind of slow down a bit and to take a take a bit of a mental break while still being physically there while on the other side we continue um i or my colleague continued with the with the operation then in some cases staged surgeries make sense while in many cases we are able to resect them just only via posterior the, the total sacrectomies we've learned the the staged surgeries in our hands worked better uh, um, or for example if we do posterior resections um, if they affect the uh, thoracolumbar junction where the diaphragm has in, in insertions then it may be easier to do an anterior release um, uh, and release the cross and everything than for the posterior uh, resection we'd like to do nurse sparing if it is oncologically feasible of course if the, if the nerve is completely encased in the tumor then we have to sacrifice it but if it is if it's stuck to tumor capsule even though it is difficult to reach then then we try to find the strategy to preserve the nerve root and then the collaboration with plastic surgery is very important as uh, as the you know the, those resections usually leave a very big void that in some cases for example the sacrectomies need to be covered and and uh, we've also had very good um, experience with bone reconstruction then with a vascularized fibula with with usually good union so the classic resection is the the spondylectomy as it has been described in 97 by tamita et al this requires however um, that the pedicles are cut and in many cases of extra compartmental tumors, which you've seen in, in the chart before, uh, that would mean that we breach tumors. Some people accept this. Um, they do a local, a, a planned breach of tumor in order to be able to use this technique. Um, we've usually tried to find a, a, a tumor-free corridor. And then what's important is that we get essentially a circumferential exposure of the spine and the tumor that looks pretty straightforward here when you only have maybe tumor inside or if we do it if you do a vertebral column resection for a spinal deformity however if a big tumor is sticking out here then all of a sudden that circum circumferential exposure um, um, getting the vessels mobilizing the vessels from the back while not being able to see anything because of that large tumor mass becomes a lot more challenging than than what it, what is shown here and that's an illustration here after um, such a circumferential exposure, complete 
um, 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 resection um, of, of, of essentially off the spine at that level. There's no more spine left at that level. That was, I think, T5. And then reconstructions with a cage. It is quite normal that we see the lungs, etc. So we just need to put chest drains then at the end of the surgery. So when is an on block resection now feasible? Well, I mean, one of the uh, um, um, criteria is clearly that we need to have somewhere a tumor-free corridor, as for example here. Um, where we know, okay, here we're gonna, if we cut into the lamina here or here, we would definitely breach the tumor. Um, so we can essentially deliver the spinal cord only through that tumor-free corridor. Because if that's not possible, if, if we still wanted to consider on block resection, it would essentially mean then spinal cord amputation or, or amputation of whatever neural structure that, that is involved, for example, in the lumbar spine or the sacrum. Um, then we need to have ideally compartmental lesions or you know we should have we, a, a, a dissection along the tumor capsule has to be possible which sometimes is not possible particularly in high grade tumors if the histology comes back as a particularly high grade tumor then one can put the question mark on this in those cases we've also seen an anterior approach for example a thoraco uh, thoracoscopic approach may be a uh, uh, useful because then we would already know if there were strong adhesions to the tumor capsule and maybe in this case then a non-block resection is is not feasible anymore so that's an example here of an aneurysm, aneurysmal bone cyst what i would like to illustrate here is how we plan um, um, uh, how we plan here the tumor corridor the bone cyst was on this it's a benign tumor but it is locally invasive and uh, here we found that on block resection was was clearly feasible and probably would would get us better tumor control in the long term and that's why we chose to do an on-block resection and the tumor-free corridor was essentially um, um, this part of the lamina here if we had gone more medial then we would have breached into the tumor which you, which you can see here and then we plan to do a cut here and also a cut, a cut off the ribs then to uh, deliver this um, uh, to, to, to is, uh, remove the tumor on, on block and that's what this looks like intraoperatively and the challenging part is is not only that sometimes the, the corridor to deliver the spinal cord is actually quite narrow what is often quite challenging is actually that we need to ligate the nerve roots over the top on the other side to be able to deliver the spinal cord through this narrow corridor sometimes you have a bit of wiggle room um, because you know if the tumor is not so solid but one should certainly avoid breaking the capsule or breaking even the specimen in half but by by trying to deliver the cord so those are some of the challenges that, that we're facing this is after resection that's what it looked like with the split of the vertebral body but then in order to be able to fit the cage and adequate bone graft we still had to sadly resect the whole thing and then reconstruct it here with the cage um, at this point we and i mentioned the role of vascularized fibula and, and the vascularized bone graft to bridge that large defect here we just put the local bone graft because we thought we had adequate bone graft from resecting the healthy uh, vertebral bodies, but that didn't result into into a good fusion and re resulted into subsidence of the cage. And then the 14-year-old patient about you know, was about a year later, or so then had to undergo another reconstruction um, here then with two fibula, which then um, which then healed in in, in the later course. This is another case of an osteoblastoma, C71, also again potentially um, a benign tumor. And but because of its size and of its location, we decided that probably maybe we felt that a non-block resection is feasible. And because of its size and because of its invasive, invasiveness, uh, it was then decided in, in the sarcoma board that if we can, we, we, we should maybe consider an, a non-block resection. And this is what we've done here. That was the planning. Um, we, we started in this case, started with an anterior approach to um, mobilize um, um, to mobilize everything the tumor from from the front and already make then a cut where we would like to then separate the tumor from the rest of the spine with parts of the vertebral body involved from the front um, which can then be completed um, from the back
Now, what we've learned over the years is that we should always try to max out what we can do from one side. So usually um, um, saying, well, that, it should be fine. We can do the rest then when we go from the back or vice versa is not a really good strategy because then all of a sudden when, when we are actually then on the other side, you know, often we think, well, we should have done that. So in general, it's, it's best to do as much as we can um, um, to then make life easier once once we're on the other side here the posterior approach uh where we then have to take the lamina off to um, um to deliver the cord through that tumor free corridor um, um dissect out the tumor and cut the rib and then essentially um complete um that cut from the back uh, if it wasn't completed already we like to do this with a bone scalpel Sometimes the blade of the bone scalpel is not long enough and then we have to complete the cut from, from the other side. And then deliver the tumor um, and essentially roll it out. Um, that often means that we have to, here we were essentially, C71, we were essentially almost in the chest cavity as we had to take two ribs to deli del deliver the tumor and that's the reconstruction afterwards. Um, now what's interesting is that this case then came back as a low grade sarcoma so we have what i didn't tell you before is we had to um sacrifice i think we had to sacrifice a c uh, c7 nerve root um, which of course rendered the patient with some weakness um, but given the fact that it then came back with a low grade sarcoma um, the patient very much accepted this and, and was very happy that we actually then did consider a non-block resection this is a C2 cortoma here, very challenging um, location um, uh, involving C2 going down to, to C3, sparing the vertebral arteries on, on both sides. And planning here involved um, several cuts, actually, you can see that best here. Planning involved a cut um, that actually went through the tip here, as you can see the cut, and with lateral cuts, um, in the in the tumor free margin such that we then essentially almost could treat it uh, as, a, as a corpectomy as you can imagine doing these cuts especially the one here from the f uh, um, from from the back then to the front out to the to the arch wasn't is uh, wasn't exactly an easy easy cut to do and then the tumor could be delivered from the front the reconstruction here entailed uh, uh, iliac crest bone graft that was then Put here between the lateral masses and the joints and secured here with the instrumentation with a screw. Why was a, an anterior cage not used? Well, there are cages uh, with a flange that one can sit can sit on, for example, the C1 arch or in some cases even on the clivus. Um, that's in this case that wasn't an option because those cages only come in titanium and because the patient um, was supposed to be sent for adjuvant uh, proton therapy um, we couldn't um, use a titanium cage so that's why it was left empty and we relied on the posterior instrumentation and the bone graft in the back and that's the image uh, oof, I don't know how much after must be about a year after or something like that uh, this is also, again, a cervical spine tumor, uh, chondrosarcoma, C5, a challenging case, Florian knows this case, he's, 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 seen, he's seen it before, where the vertebral artery on one side was involved, and planning here um, um, involved um, an, a balloon occlusion test of the contralateral vertebral artery to give, give us peace of mind that we actually can uh, resect the vertebral artery on the other side. The patient already had a pathologic fracture, so he was a bit uh, query whether we can um, actually um, resect the tumor on block. We then stayed, did a, 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 f, um, a first stage from the back where we isolated, where we already ligated the vertebral artery um, on, on the side where we want to resect it and uh, um, uh, uh, um, freed up the vertebral artery on the contralateral side such that we can then remove, deliver the tumor from the front, which we then did in a second stage. This is the specimen, and that's the view from the front where you see the spinal cord here, you, you see the rod in the back, so you can essentially can, one can basically see through the spine um, with the C5, C6 nerve roots ligated and the C7 nerve root here intact. And then um, we reconstructed this with a cage and put the fibula uh, 
ne next to it as here that is secured with plates. This patient had a very good um, um, long-term follow-up um, with, and this is the um, post-operative X-ray. He also had then a because of the C5 and C6 nerve roots, which were uh, sacrificed. He then had a, um, a reconstruction with a nerve transfer, the transfer done by plastic surgery, and and he almost regained full um, um, uh, shoulder function. He sent a, a picture of a of a shelf to to my colleague that he put up, showing that he can clearly do uh, work over shoulder uh, level um, with with both of both of his upper extremities. Then uh, changing anatomic region here, another very challenging uh, case are the, um, are the sacral uh, chordomas. Uh, sometimes they're quite advanced here, breaching into the uh, sacral iliac joint on the right side, uh, going up into the uh, tumor, into the L5 S1 frame, in, into the joint. The question there is, of course, you know, what can we preserve? Can we preserve the L5 nerve root on the right side, or do we have to resect it with the foramen? Or can we resect just the superior articular process of S1, leave the foramen intact, then isolate the L5 nerve root um, over the tumor? Um, can we preserve the S2 nerve roots? And the S1 right is clearly in the tumor, as you can see in the MRI, and that had to had to be sacrificed. And this really matters because, you know, from, from earlier works, we know that de depending on what nerve roots we can spare that has a huge impact on motor bladder and bowel uh, bowel function so as soon as we get above the s2 level then we have a then we have a, um, um, a very significant deterioration in, in bladder bowel bladder function certainly with s1 and above in terms of motor function as well um, um, when the s1 and sometimes the l5 nerve roots are sacrificed in order to access this, uh, we have to essentially um, access the sacroiliac joint from the front. We do this in, in, in two stages, first with an anterior stage, um, in most cases the transperitoneal approach, sacrifice the nerve roots that we know already know we need to sacrifice, so separate them from the lumbosacral plexus, do the osteotomy cuts and release the discs if, if we need to split the discs. In some cases, when we cannot resect the, uh, or spare the L5 nerve root, we need to resect the foramen and, and then we need to go up and, and, and to the L5 disc and split the L5 vertebral body from the front to be able then to, to uh, deliver the tumor. Uh, on block. Um, the cuts um, lateral to the SI joints are usually the plane that we uh, um, look for is between the psoas and the vessels. If we go down there, then that's usually where we find the SI joint and, and can make them the lateral cuts from this. And this is usually done together with the general surgeon because they, they need to do a stoma such we then um, uh, um, um, to then allow for the um, um, uh, resection that helps us with with care that helps with initial continence and this can be then reconnected um, 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 the stoma can be reverted um, should the should the patient then still have sphincter function after after the resection the posterior exposure then um, essentially um, uh, uh, allows then to deliver uh, the tumor. We need to complete all the cuts that we do from the back, ligate the nerve roots that, that we have to do, um, do a transverse cut at the upper level, um, wherever the resection level is, that may be the L5 S1 disc. In some cases, it is only half of the L4 5 disc, for example, in this case, where, where if we would like to, or if we have to uh, sacrifice the L5 nerve roots. And that is what the specimen uh, looks like here. This was a tumor that was delivered um, uh, uh, SI joints uh, were both involved. This is what the reconstruction looks like. Small detail here is the mesh that we have to put in because as you can imagine there is no there is the no more barrier between the, uh, um, between the posterior aspect of the body and and the bowels and the uh, and the peritoneal space. So I've had cases where I went back with the plastic surgeon and um, to do the fibula reconstruction here, um, uh, where we then found that actually bowel was almost wrapped around the dural sac. So that's when we then started to use meshes and and fixate fix them with either sutures or even anchors in 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 into the uh, remaining um, iliac bone. 
that's what the reconstruction looks like a fibula that that is separated and sometimes one can make this triangle then to reconstruct the continuity between the spine and and, and the pelvis um, over this instrumentation here and that's what the flap insert then looks like it also helps cover the dead space and, and helps, of course, then with wound care. The fact that we have a stoma also helps greatly with wound care because we don't get any contamination then of, of that wound uh, with feces. Um, and sometimes the reconstructions are, are quite um, uh, are quite creative. And it was actually the, pl the plastic surgeon's I idea to do this. This was a hind quarter amputation um, uh, that we had to do. And because we could spare and had almost a healthy leg, um, we kept the vasculature and the, and, and the femur and used the distal femur then to, um, um, to, uh, to essentially reconstruct the ischium uh, such the patient has again something to to sit on and that was the fixation that we did because that only came from went to one part of of the aliac wing because here here it was missing um uh, we then had to um uh, come up with a fixation and those are actually pedicle screws in 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 a femur and that's what what it looks like which allowed the patient then um, to have a better sitting balance as if there was no bone left because then sitting becomes a, a, a much uh, becomes a big problem so in conclusion i think we stop here um, those are really rare and challenging procedures on block resections in general although they are challenging and laborious procedures result in better local tumor control and potentially high rate of survival in the most common primary tumors of the spine than any type of intralesional uh, resection. So although they're techni technically challenging, a block resection at the moment is still the gold standard. Until we have something that can either control biology better or we have, we clearly can show that radiotherapy can achieve the same local tumor control and potentially survival at a much lower morbidity, maybe together only with debulking. But for the time being, in all malignant primary tumors, we really have to get it right the first time. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I think we'll take questions now. Uh, yes, thank you, Dominic, for this uh, comprehensive uh, overview and the complex surgical treatment of uh, primary spinal tumors. So for, for all participants of the webinar, if you have a question, please use the, the Q&A box or the chat and uh, we will discuss your questions, your, your coming questions then. Um, I'd like to start with a question uh, regarding the point of neurological deficit prior to surgery and identifying a primary tumor, which is always a problem. Yes. Um, as as we, 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 we tend to be driven by neurological deficits, like in an emergency <clears throat> bed, operating this, doing quick surgery for neurological deficit. And I think it's, it's for, for cases you do not operate, it's hard where you suspect the primary tumor. It's hard to justify yeah. um, well whether it's a primary tumor or not. Uh, so how would you how would do you, how do you handle those cases? Sir? Which yeah. one is the most suspicious one for for a primary tumor? And um, as we do know for uic sarcoma, that the patient with a uic sarcoma and the neurodeficit deficit can recover quite well under chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, without touching this tumor, which is uh, from an oncological standpoint, superior and neurologically justified. Yeah, exactly. It was the best outcome. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point. And this is really, you know, a clinical dilemma that we're facing uh, quite often. And, you know, and uh, we, we, we've had this on occasions and it usually also causes quite a bit of anxiety and, and unrest within, uh, unease within the team because, um, um, it is, is very clear if the patient comes in and has, a, say, a mild or an already established neurologic deficit, which at this point is stable, we suspect the primary tumor or already have the diagnosis of a primary tumor. In most cases, we don't already have the diagnosis of the primary tumor, but we suspect it. Then, um, then we have always urged the team to wait 
and not intervene at this point if the neurologic deficit is stable. If there's core compression, say core compression and not a, a, no neurologic deficit at this point, the patient, however, still has an emergency admission. The yeah. call surgeon is getting nervous, is like, well, what do I do with this when this happens? Well, then what we've done is we've identified, we said, for example, look here, you have a, a, a safe corridor. You can take this much bone of the lamina away. And should the patient uh, deteriorate neurologically or have an evolving neurologic deficit that we cannot wait any longer on, then then you can decompress as much as as here. That that that's how you can do. And in in, yeah. in very many cases, this is actually <laughs> su sufficient. So we then um, um, we then decompress the cord and, um, and 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 don't burn any bridges to still allow for. Um, an unblocked resection. There's a caveat to this, though. Is you know sometimes depending on how much invasion there is in the spinal cord, the the cord could be quite under pressure, and and then only making a small window is not advisable. Then you have to go and do a much longer laminectomy, um, also in the tumor-free areas, to then allow the cord to drift back because otherwise it, it is just it just drifts back in one area and is then is then impinged then against the intact lamina and that uh, um we, we've seen a case of this that then caused the neurologic deficit so that, that that's that's a point to consider but it it's uh it's the clinical decision making dilemma and it it takes it takes a bit of um, um a bit of experience to then say no let's sit tight and because the reflex is neurology we need to go back in and decompress the cord right away right so yeah. but that may not always be in the best interest of the patient yeah i think this is this is a very important point the the recommendation to decompress in a part which is not tumor uh carrying uh to to get released in a patient which is still and still has the suspicion well, of carrying a primary tumor and it, i mean if the tumor is circumferential then all block resections as such is not possible anyways depending you yeah. know and um then one can also intervene in, uh, on, a, on an urgent basis. Okay, so uh, con concerning um, biopsies of those tumors and, and the histology, on how, how do you usually get biopsies of these tumors? Is there CT guided biopsies? Do you do uh, shielded trocar? Uh, and how do you how do you deal with the uh, biopsy trajectories? Do you still excise those trajectories, or is it no longer necessary in, when using a shielded trocar? No, we've yeah we've never. I mean, we we entirely rely on on the on the interventional radiologists to do that. Uh, they're um, they're I guess in most cases CT guided, um, and no, we do not um, um, we do not necessarily mark or resect the site of of uh, or the trajectory of the, of the of the biopsy, and you know, given the follow ups that that we have, and you know, in Oxford we've had follow ups over ten years. You know, like uh, this has not. I mean. I think it's still done in 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 uh, limb orthopedics. Um, they they still very much try to uh, resect the tra trajectory and and uh, um, but you know don't don't um, don't hold me to it. I would have I would have to ask them. Um, but in the spine, no, we've we've not actually paid any special special attention to that. Okay. Now we have some questions. Now the the first one is about pediatric cases. Uh, is there any difference in pediatric cases in the surgical approaches, prevalence and prognosis of those primary tumors? Well, I mean, that depends on the tumor type. The, the kids present with different types of tumors, right? So, um, um, yeah, it, 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 very, it very much depends. Um, I remember one case where, hmm, I don't remember what type of tumor it was. Um, but, you know, when, when the, in order to be able to do such an unblock resection you, you need to have some sort of a solid tumor um you know the the the, the, the ideal is or is, is a chondrosarcoma which is usually quite a hard uh, a tumor but if the tumor is is relatively soft which was the case in, in this pediatric tumor then and invading the canal then an unblock resection is not possible because you you will not get that plane the tumor will as soon as you're there it will fall apart um, um so in these cases um we do not attempt on block resections okay. not in that way i have a, a question from uh, switzerland from enrico tessitore is asking about your opinion about carbon, carbon cages icotech cages or 
and the, the option of customized cages um, made for the individual patients. Yeah. Um, so in Oxford in the past years, we have started using custom made carbon implants. Um, that's just to facil facilitate um, adjuvant uh, proton or carbon therapy. Um, that clearly has a role also for monitoring any uh, potential, um, uh, let's hope not recurrence. Yeah. So, so for disease monitoring that that's, that's much better. Um, so yeah, they, um, uh, those type of uh, radiolucent implants clearly ha have a role. Um, um, also with the screws, the, the, the handling of course, especially to an orthopedic surgeon, you know, when we used to bend rods and titanium is, 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 is clearly very different and, requires a bit getting used to. Okay. Now we have a question regarding, uh, I think it's regarding the case of the C2 Cordona. Um, if you would place a cage in, in this case, how, how, would, how would you approach it or, or proceed the question? How, how did you get to C, C2? Did you do a transcervical from below? Did you do a transoral in this case? Cutting no transoral, no, no. With the the tip um, uh, was was done from posterior, um, essentially with with a with a very oblique trajectory to the cord. Um, um, the, the 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 target point was the mid of the C1 arch um, that we could see in X-ray and then direct the the the, the bone scalpel blade um, and to that area. We also knew that this is most this is according to the CT, there was a bit of an osteolysis, which caused a bit of, um, um, uh, yeah, we, we were not certain at some point whether one may, whether we may have breached the tumor there um, because there was an osteolysis, um, uh, but that was just the natural structure of the bone of, of, the, of the odontoid peg in this case. Um, whereas the MRI then clearly shows that actually tumor finishes below. So, um, so the target point was was the C1 arch, the midpoint of the C1 arch, because that, that way we knew that we're going to be um, clear of tumor, and then made made an oblique cut through that, um, um, which you can approach from from both sides than from posterior. So that that cut wasn't done from the front; that was done from the back. So that means you did the the most superior cut from the back, cutting away the the, the tip of. Uh you don't have tip plus yeah. putting in half and then see one arch and then you went from yeah. trans cervical below doing the lateral cuts and the the inferior cuts. yeah complete the uh, lateral cuts they were already all, they were also done from from the front uh, uh, from the back already okay and you did go That's trans cervical from complete and you join them up essentially yeah. yeah sometimes you don't find them uh, right away but that's why that's why that nice ct ct scan because that's uh, something uh, um that uh, that we always did is is um, when we had two stages like this, we'd like to have CT scans between the two stages because you could uh, could precisely see where the cuts were made, um, and that, that that that's why it's also why we can demonstrate it like that. Yeah. Okay, we we'll, we'll have a question from Andreas Dimitradis. Uh, he says, can, "Can you comment on timing of organizing a case from time of presentation?" Uh, potential of metastatic compression, chondrosarcoma versus chordoma, and the, the need to get a multidisciplinary team. Uh, what would you ad advocate as a good time window to plan surgery in chordoma versus chondrosarcoma? Well, I mean, the, it's a very long question. I'm not sure. So, timing of surgery, how much? What do you think? Well, uh, chordoma and chondrosarcoma are are, uh, are slow growing tumors, right? And and um, and. You know, given all the workup that's needed, given the timelines, also uh, when I was still working in the NHS, um, uh, um, you know, we we plan those. You know, not like you're somewhere on a waiting list and and uh, uh, you have your surgery whenever it's your turn. You know, we plan those in in uh, as, as soon as we can. But you know, there's if they're neurologically stable, there's not. I mean, we we don't need to rush it. We have time to do. A proper workup, a proper discussion, get the team aligned. Um, if the plastic surgeon, if the general surgeon needs to, you know, find find a date, uh, weeks, months down the line. Again, they're slow growing tumors. If there's no imminent neurologic or evolving neurologic deficit, then then we have that time. Okay. 
there was a question regarding um, predictors. I would call it predictors of functional outcome and and overall oncological outcome. And I think you, you mentioned the the most important predictor of oncological outcome is which is any kind appropriate versus inappropriate resection mm -hmm. uh, those tumors. But but are there further further aspects of let's say the tumor graft patient cofactors uh, which are very relevant for the the functional outcome which is of course level hate and the the, the, the nerve roots yeah. are sacrificed and for the prognosis of patients there anything else well i mean it's such a mixed bag of of uh of, you know like no no tumor is like the other right um um when <laughs> Um, it depends on the location, on the extension of the tumor, um, what structures they involve, um, and, and that then governs the outcome. Generally, the bigger and the closer to any vital structures or in, when it's encasing nerve roots, etc., then, you know, the surgeries are longer, the, the morbidity is higher, and the functional outcome may be less. But, you know, like, even if uh, we had patients that, you know, did not, were not paralyzed during surgery, but then, for example, had a problem with a flap or so, which then resulted, unfortunately, in, into paralysis. And, um, you know, even so, you know, when it was oncologically, uh, when the, the surgery was, when we had clear margins and that was communicated to the patient, you know, they accepted that, um, um, uh, they accept, accepted this morbidity given, given the underlying disease. Certainly, you know, if we in the future have an alternative um, such that we can operate to do, do, do smaller surgeries with less morbidity and, and treat them with adjuvant um, uh, uh, radiotherapy or biological treatment that, you know, that would be preferable. Yeah, But it's, I mean, it, it's really the, the, the structures that is close to whatever we have to sacrifice. And, and then the oncologic prognosis versus the morbidity of the um, of the of the resection then governs whether we actually uh, should consider it or not and in some cases you know in elderly patients we know that oncologically anatomically the right thing would the right thing to do would be an block resection but the patient is just not fit to tolerate that amount of surgery that was also the case and it's sometimes difficult if they have neural compression if they have pain then do uh, tell them no you should just go for radiotherapy for example yeah okay good thank you dominic excellent presentation excellent discussion i'm thinking many thank you very much for important things for having me covered and um, clarified um now thanks for for this for this time uh, now, our next um, webinar for the spine section will be November 2nd. Uh, the topic needs to be defined and will be announced uh, in, um, in advance to, to, to the webinar, of course. Um, whenever you as the, the audience have any special topic, you would like to have a webinar and now, please, please send me an email and we will, will consider your, your wishes, your, your suggestions of topic for, for further webinars. So for that, today, once again, thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening to you, Dominic, and everything else uh, listening. Thank you. And uh, see you next time, beginning of November. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See you in Belgrade. <laughs> yeah, see you in Belgrade first, of course. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.